All right, thank you all for joining me today. What is the first image that comes to your mind when you hear someone say human rights abuse? Is it the photo of somebody that you've seen that some government has locked up for speaking up? Or is it the unhoused person that you passed on the street yesterday? Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government, end of quote. And if he were alive today, I believe he would probably call it the greatest purveyor of human rights abuses. In those cases where our government sanctions or invades someone to punish the people for trying to secure more rights for themselves and for others, I hope we can move from just simply condemning our government to also give these people our solidarity. This talk is very personal for I will be drawing on my experiences in Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, Venezuela, Mexico, Cuba, and Palestine. I uh, almost on my sabbatical trip, almost made it to Aristides, Haiti, but I ran out of money. And by the time the next summer came around, the coup had happened and there was no revolution there to visit. Uh, <clears throat> raise your hand if you've been to any of these places. Anybody in Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, Venezuela, Mexico, Cuba, or Palestine, or Haiti? I am seeing some hands up. I am seeing, uh, wow, great, wow. That is really great. It's almost everybody. Some people have worked so much in the United States on issues, they haven't had time to go to other countries. Um, all right. Let's see if we can stretch our minds to encompass a wider range of um, okay, a wider range of human rights. I can't think and do internet stuff at the same time. Um, a wider range of uh, human rights by looking at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is uh, was enacted 73 years ago today. I'm going to quiz you on this, so pay attention. All right. Um, Article one, all these rights are ours by birth. Article two, these rights belong to all, no matter what one's wealth, color, gender, language, religion, or nation of origin. Article three, they include the right to feel and be safe. Four, to be free from any form of slavery, to be free from torture, to be treated as a person before the law, to be treated equally by the law, to be able to go to court if we believe these rights have been violated. No one should be arrested without a good reason. All who are arrested have the right to tell their story and be considered innocent until proven guilty. No one may invade the privacy of others. All may move around within their country, leave it and return. Everyone has the right to belong to a national community. The right to marry whom we choose the right to own property, to practice the religion they believe in, to speak their mind and express their ideas, 
to join organizations. Look at, there we are. There's the ICUJP to join organizations, to take part in making decisions, to receive aid if the needs arise from either our country or from throughout the world, to have good paying jobs with a safe workplace and to have leisure time, to have food, shelter, and medical care, to have education, including education to learn about human rights. That's all in there. Uh, to be artistic and re receive the rewards from their work, to be at peace at home and in the world. And here's a really important one. All of us have the responsibility to ensure other people's rights. And all have these rights until we die. No one may take them away. So here's the first discussion. Just like raise your hand if you'd like to answer it. How does the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, differ from the Bill of Rights? I mean, obviously it's international and there are 30 articles instead of 10 amendments. How do you see the difference? What's covered in the UDHR that's not covered in the Bill of Rights? Um, no hands are up. Ah, uh, Anthony. Well, I think the uh, UN Declaration of Rights covers a lot of economic rights. I'm so sorry. Can you say that again? You're really breaking oh, up. Okay, let me get. Can you hear me better now? That's better. All right. So the UN Declaration of Rights has a lot of economic rights that are covered in the. Uh, Bill of Rights. Is that not right? Anthony, we cannot hear you with your mic using your microphone. Okay. Or at least it's breaking up. How about now? Can you hear me now? I guess. Well, he oh, says that. Does anybody else have a comment and we'll get back to Anthony? What's the difference? What's included in the human UDHR that's not included in the Bill of Rights? And this is how we stretch our concept and rethink human rights because we usually think in the Bill of Rights and there's so much more. I mean, 20, 30 articles instead of 10 amendments. All right, Anthony. One more time, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Oh, great, I've got my nice microphone here. Okay, so the UN. You gone? No. Not now. Lost you again, Anthony. All right. So just use the microphone in your laptop. Jennifer, do you want to say something? Um, there's a right to education. Uh, including right to education about human rights in the mm -hmm. UN Declaration. That's not in our Bill of Rights. Right. Stephen, Steve? Well, in this holiday season, I don't want to be the Grinch, but Article 19 allows exceptions to freedom of speech and freedom of the press, which would not be recognized under the First Amendment, leading some European countries to crack down on controversial or offensive speech. Uh, it's a very difficult issue for a lot of people. It's probably worth a separate uh, talk someday, but mm -hmm. it's uh, one case of where uh, the exceptions go uh, in the other direction. Well, do you want to say a word, a sentence or so about 19? Well, it, 19 starts out beautifully as a strong declaration of conscience, the freedom of conscience, the freedom 
of speech, and I believe press may be in there, but it has this uh, broad exception. And although it's well-meaning, the exception speaks of speech that denigrates any uh, political, religious, ethnic group, uh, all too often those exceptions have been used to suppress the speech of uh, insurrectionist and uh, I, I shouldn't use that word, um, uh, counter speech of people struggling for their rights and governments have invoked the exceptions to suppress the speech of uh, the opposition political parties, uh, minority religious groups and others. Okay. So it's one of can, those cases can, where that we balance- We move on because I really want like one sentence, two I'm sentences. Sorry, you, you asked me to elaborate. <laughs> That's dangerous when you ask me. About I know, and we will have Q and A. And the more Q, no, shorter our responses now, the more Q and A we'll have later. Right? Oh God! Did your hand up? Yeah. So very briefly, because I, I think that Anthony had a, a really good um, uh, thought that he was trying to convey. Uh, the the economic rights are, are in there too that aren't in our Bill of Rights. Everybody has the right to own property alone, as well as in association with others. There right. there is a uh, uh, a right to health care, which mm -hmm. is not in ours. So you know, I just want to make sure that was Anthony's thought was out there. That's that's I I'm glad you heard Anthony because that's. The essence of the difference is the cultural, economic, and social rights that are in there. Um, the Bill of Rights enshrines really important human rights, but not the right to eat or to have a roof over our heads. On the other hand, the Cuban, Venezuelan, Nicaraguan, and Haitian constitu uh, constitutions recognize these rights. For instance, Article 22 of the Haitian Constitution says, quote, the state recognizes the right of every citizen to decent housing, education, food, and social security, end of quote. Sounds like a constitutional amendment for us, right? These people in these revolutionary countries debated in their numerous organizations what they wanted in their new constitution or else they voted on them in plebiscites. We're going to explore how some of these rights may clash with other ones, particularly civil and political rights enshrined in the Bill of Rights, clashing with the economic, social and cultural ones that are left out. First, a couple national examples. Remember Skokie, Illinois? Remember a Jewish ACLU lawyer defending the right of Nazis to march through a neighborhood with a sizable population of Holocaust survivors? The National Lawyers Guild accused the ACLU of poisonous even-handedness. But I've been reading articles about how the AD, uh, ACLU has been rethinking the issue over the years and as it's become more diverse, uh, struggling with this very question. I believe that some future Friday forum that we should share this. So I'm not sharing my ideas about it here. Here's another example of the clash of rights, domestic, but with the applications of the global, the Citizens United ruling. Raise your hand if you agree that the Koch brothers and other millionaires and billionaires have the right to spend however much money they wish to, to influence elections, that this is a First Amendment right. Okay, I'm looking for hands coming up. Well, I'm not seeing any hands coming up. So raise your hand if you disagree with that. Okay, we're beginning to see people who disagree with the idea there, uh, with the idea that um, that means only three people so far are participating one way or the other. Let's um, 
So uh, we do Carol Francis, you. could you repeat that? I'm sorry, I just didn't okay. understand the question. Raise your hand if you agree that the Koch brothers and other millionaires and billionaires have the right to spend however much money they wish to influence elections, that this is protected by the First Amendment. And nobody raised their hand there. And then I said, raise your hands if you disagree with that. And four people raised their hands. Ah, so, well, that ruling got outvoted in ours, but it doesn't look like most people have an opinion, which is surprising. Now let's look, uh, so we do believe that there are limits to free speech. In this case, it's out of respect for the right of people to choose how they're governed as enshrined by UDHR Article 21, the right to make decisions. Now let's look at how those rights can clash with each other in an international example, Nicaragua. I have visited Nicaragua six times and I remember the controversy around the counter-revolutionary newspaper, La Prensa, which was largely financed by the giant to the north in order to crush the revolution. I remember hearing about La Prensa articles claiming that sta statues and churches were seen weeping over the church, uh, the sins of the Sandinistas. Um, it's a devastating lie when told to a population just rising out of centuries of enforced backwardness. And I remember also seeing a reprint of a photo of what might have been two submarines submerged in water, which the prince had printed and said were Soviet subs in Nicaragua. The Sandinistas tolerated this continuous lying. Now, I'm asking you to vote on something, and I hope we get more participation, to vote on something that might take a moment of thinking about it, but that's okay. Raise your hand if you believe a government has to permit people to propagate lies, particularly ones designed to make people overthrow their government or to vote against their own interests. Okay, we have four people believing that. Raise your hand if you believe that there are conditions in which a government um, may stop the propagation of lies. Oh, it's just about a tie. Ooh, we get more. It's not, right. only a, it's not only a tie, some people voted yes to both. Well, I, I did, I, I did. I think that, well, we'll have this discussion later. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, and like I said, it may take you some thinking about it. Raise your hand if you think that they have the right to stop um, lies about them. Lies that are particularly designed to make people overthrow their government or vote against their own interests if they're funded by a hostile outside government. Mm. Okay, thank you. It's still kind of a tie, but um, we're thinking about it. The um, Sandinistas did La Pre uh, tolerate La Prensa for years, but finally they temporarily closed it down. Well, I don't remember hearing about El Salvador, Honduras, uh, Guatemalan government closing down Nicod uh, dis um, dissident newspapers. No, they just assassinated hundreds of journalists and burned their offices. I was in Nicaragua at the time they closed down. Um, oh, about that, the lack of response from this, from Reagan, 
and the capitalist press reminded me of Jesse Jackson telling us, quote, we must measure the world by the same yardstick, end of quote. I was in Nicaragua at the time they closed down the office of La Prensa, and I remember an elected official saying, now we can work without ants in our shirts. In the Nicaraguan elections of 1984, the Sandinistas won two thirds of the vote against seven rival parties. In the following election in 1990, they lost. Why? The war and the embargo sponsored by our government was a big part of it, but also was the Sandinista response to this. It was not from having too much socialism as the capitalist press said, but having too little. Their fatal mistake was capitulating to the United States, allowing them to finance a rival candidate. They hoped that in return, the US would lift the embargo and end the war. The results were they gained nothing and Nicaragua became ruled by a government that routinely violated the human rights of people. I remember in my sixth trip, the in the first year of the counter-revolutionary government, seeing a massive shanty town where there had been none before. And a fellow internationalist told me that he watched it grow day by day. Poor children could no longer attend school. While the government had fountains built to decorate the square to impress visiting King of Spain. I remember seeing people from the shanty towns washing their clothes in these fountains. So now leading up to last month's Nicaraguan elections, cries went up from the capitalist press in the US and its allies because the national parliament had illegalized the taking of foreign money for elections and the police arrested those who violated those new laws. Imagine, arresting members of the elite for breaking a law. Okay, the next vote. Um, everybody would lower your hands if you haven't already. Um, if it were a matter of raising, risking their vulnerable population being plunged back into poverty, violating their rights to food, shelters, healthcare, and schools, or possibly on the other hand, violating someone's freedom of expression. Raise your hand if you feel the elected representatives do have the right to pass and enforce laws curtailing the speech of candidates by limiting funds that any campaign can spend. I find this one difficult because I believe in campaign fund limits anyway. So it's something okay. to do with the rest of it. So I don't know which way to vote in that. No, you do believe that um, funds can be uh, denied to, to people, to candidates, so that the rich can't overwhelm the airwaves and everything. Okay. So do, do, that's the question. Do you believe that? Okay. Um, do you believe that the country has the right to uh, limit or absolutely forbid foreign money from other governments, particularly hostile governments that are trying to destroy them? Raise your hand if you believe the governments have the right to do that. Oh, that's one of our biggest so far. All right, moving from Nicaragua on to Venezuela. In Caracas, I was only in Venezuela for four days. It was my shortest trip, but it was really good. In Caracas, I stood and watched a man across the plaza from me hawking these little black books. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. In Los Angeles, um, people stand on street corners shouting out the Bible over megaphones but in Venezuela, because of their literacy campaign, people actually sell or give away Bibles instead. Finally, I watched this and I watched people stop and talk to this man. Someone went off with a book 
And finally, I went over to him and asked, ¿Qué es el libro? What's the book? And he answered, La Constitución. The Constitution. The Venezuelan people wrote their constitution and they want people to read it. Dictators, by the way, don't do that. Can you imagine people standing at Wilshire in Vermont hawking the US constitution? Haiti. I wasn't there, but I was in spirit. And I read uh, Aristide's book and there was a book uh, of his writings. Aristide in his first election campaigned on the promise of dignified poverty. He signed a decree raising the minimum wage from the equivalent of $1.07 to $2.57 a day. For that, he was brought down. Who fought him on this? Levi Strauss, Haynes, Disney. Watch a documentary called Mickey Mouse Goes to Haiti about how Disneyland souvenir shirts are made. And of course, the US government. Going on to Cuba. The first time I saw Cuba was under the ideal circumstances in that it was immediately after my spending time in El Salvador, Mexico, Guatemala and post-revolutionary Nicaragua. In Guatemala, I interviewed teachers union, the teachers union president in their secret office secret in order to prevent his assassination by the death squads. Later, I saw two sad little boys get on a bus, sing to us, and walk around begging for coins. In El Salvador, I met a teacher. I, I wouldn't ask a Salvadoran teacher to speak on the death squads and how they're targeting teachers. So I asked, uh, even if they didn't have anybody around, which was the case then, so I asked a broad question. I said, what's it like teaching in El Salvador? I'm from Los Angeles, I teach in Los Angeles. She changed the subject, but she invited me into her home. She, uh, you can ask that question in here, she told me after closing the door behind her, but never out there. And she changed the subject, unable to face the question, even in her own home. Then I went on to Cuba, where I didn't see kids begging. And I met this Cuban youth who walked beside me uninvited as I walked through Havana streets, taking, talking to me in a normal voice about fear Cubans feel of their government. We were not passing others by, but he wasn't looking around to see who might be approaching. And he kept on going on and on to me, a stranger about this fear. Finally, I stopped him and told him about the Salvadoran teacher who couldn't even talk about her situation in her own home. You have no idea what fear feels like, I told him. He didn't say any more after that and soon walked away. Religious freedom in Cuba, man, there are churches everywhere. And at a major street party thrown for Catavanistas and neighborhood pope by the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Havana, a Cuban woman told me, this is my church. I'm an Episcopalian, but Ebenezer is ecumenical. And another year, we attended a conference of Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Shall we talk about elections? Okay, if you can answer this question, just unmute yourself and shout it out. How many political parties participate in Cuban elections? One. What? One. One? Somebody mm -hmm. said? One, yeah. <laughs> Wrong answer. The answer is zero because the Cuban constitution forbids the Cuban Communist Party from interfering with elections. So I'm going to show you this slide. And what it is, is um, some website had this chart up. This is a segment of it, the opening segment of it. And I went, it's, um, 
Oh, uh, excuse me. I hear uh, it's a chart showing the election turnout of different nations. I highlight the ones that had more than 80% of their eligible populations voting and noted if a country had mandatory participation. So check this out. First of all, I thought it was interesting that countries that had mandatory uh, participation in their elections didn't necessarily have good turnouts. But check this out. This is for this year that this went up on the website. United States, 56.84%, Cuba, 85.65%. And I've seen it as high as in the 90s, in the upper 90s of turnout. So how is this possible? How could it be? Well, one reason is that Cuba, in Cuba, no private money is allowed in campaigning. Candidates are nominated in their neighborhoods and they're allowed an equal number of words and the same size photo for the campaign. There are two grave violations of human rights in Cuba, Guantanamo and the blockade. So why the huge protest demonstrations this last July? This excellent uh, series that I want you all to watch, at least part five, The War on Cuba. Um, it's a series created in Cuba by C Cubans but the, with the executive producers, that is the financiers and fundraisers, including Danny Glover, Oliver Stone, Medea Benjamin, and Jody Evans. It explains the reasons for the uh, protests in more detail than I have time to go over now. This is Liz, a journalist and the host of the program. As she explains, the protests started in a town near Havana. And President Miguel Diaz Canel went to talk with the people, just like Fidel used to do when there was any disturbance. When protests broke out in many places, the largest protests, uh, they were the largest protests in all the years of the revolution. But the economy improved so much and COVID cases went down as people were vaccinated and the country quieted down. Liz asked a number of protesters, why did you protest? She would, um, the, the answers always came back to the economy, the blackouts, the recent surge in COVID cases, the sudden lack of medications because of the blockade. When she asked who was responsible, some blame the US for tightening the blockade, others blame Cuban leaders. She asked this one man who blamed the Cubans. She asked him, how do you stay informed? And he answered, Facebook. Well, Facebook can put out lies. And someone posted this on Facebook and it was evidently went all over. Um, they said this was one of the marches during the protest, but a French fact check agency revealed that it's actually a pro-revolution May Day march. Biden gave 6.6 .6 million of our tax dollars to these anti-Cuba groups. He promised he had promised in his campaign to return to Obama's Cuba policy, but is doing the opposite. So why is the US doing this? This is from a US State Department memo. You can get it right off of the State Department website, April, 1960. The majority of the Cubans support Castro, the only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenchantment and disaffection this affection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. If such a policy is adopted, it would be the result 
It should be the result of positive decision, which would call forth a line of action, which while being as adroit and inconspicuous as possible, makes the greatest inroads into denying money and supplies to Cuba to decrease monetary and real wages, to bring about hunger, desperation, and an overthrow of the government. Now, despite what Biden or anybody else would say, that is the purpose of the US blockade. That's their words. But going on to the civil and political rights, the Bill of Rights type, and speaking on the economic, social, and cultural ones, Cuba not only has remarkably developed tuition-free education, housing, uh, universal medical care in spite of severe economic hardships, but it shares advances with other nations. It, is on the way to becoming the first nation to be fully vaccinated, uh, to fully vaccinate its entire population and is doing so with a vaccine developed by Cuban scientists. But it also has plans to make more of this vaccine to share it with poor countries, just as Cuban doctors have been volunteering all over the world for years. I could spend the whole hour talking about Cuba's internationalism but instead, let's play Spot the Difference. You know how to play Spot the Difference? I show you two photos and I give you five seconds to spot the difference. You ready? Ah, you, you all got it and it didn't even take you five seconds. Okay, this is a chart from Gapminder, which compares different nations per capita income with its longevity. You see lifespan going up on the left side. You see income on the right side. If you check out the compass rows, you see that it's the rich, the poor, the sick, and the healthy. So what this shows, oh, and the circles, of course, are nations. They're color-coded by region, key at the left, I mean at the right, and the size of the circle is the population. So you see that um, the very obvious thing is that the more money a country has, the longer is their country's average lifespan. The further to the right the circle is, the greater is the wealth per capita, the circle, um, the higher it is, the better the, um, the longer the average lifespan. Now, this one shows that um, Vietnam and India both have about the same per capita wealth, but Vietnamese live longer on the average. And here we see the United States and Cuba, that little tiny dot that the left arrow is pointing to, um, that the US is far wealthier than Cuba, but the two countries enjoy fairly much the same longevity. This is the Living Planet Report that came out in 2006 by the uh, World Wildlife Fund, not exactly a commie organization. The chart shows the human footprint and the, uh, the ecological footprint and the human development index of different nations. Again, the circles are color-coded by region and, um, and sized for the uh, population. Over here, you see where it says this blue line where it says threshold for high human development. We want, all, um, we notice the countries that are to the right of that line. They're the ones that have a human index uh, 
that um, if this shows their, if they're feeding their people on the average, education, healthcare, and such, meeting human needs. But below this blue line, this horizontal line here, where it says at world average biocapacity available per person, ignoring the needs of the wild species. In order to survive and not destroy the earth in the process, we need to keep all countries below this line. So here's the question. Where do we want, raise your hand if you can answer this. Where do we want all countries to be? I don't see any hands. Come on, where in this globe do we want to push all these circles? What part? Ah, Stephanie. In the little blue box on the lower right, I believe, if I'm reading this, the, the chart. You correctly. are, you are. We want to push all these yellow ones, which is mostly African nations, into that zone where they're meeting their people's needs, we want to bring all of these people, these countries that are destroying the population down to this little blue box. And zooming in on that, what do you see? Somebody? Is it still Stephanie? Nobody else? There's one country in there. What country is that? Cuba. Okay. Okay, you notice it's red. It's Latin American and Caribbean. Yes, as this article, this report, this state, Cuba is the only country that meets criteria for sustainability. And what does this have to do with human rights? Well, being up above this line means you are depriving other nations of what their people need to satisfy their human rights. And also means you're stealing that, those human rights from future generations. That was then, 2006, this is now. This chart, by the way, comes from the uh, war on Cuba um, the same one, uh, episode five. And I really hope everybody watches that. War on Cuba, at least episode five, but all of them. Okay. Finally, wrapping this up, Palestine, Israel. I went to Palestine's West Bank in 2004 and to Gaza in 2009. On both trips, I witnessed Israel's cruelty and heard from a few of its victims. There has not been a single case of Palestinian tanks rolling across the Green Line into any Jewish neighborhood, occupying it for even a single minute. And even the Israeli human rights group, Bet Salem, reports that there are 19 times as many Palestinians killed by Israelis than the reverse. The U.S. total aid to Israel since its founding has been $146 billion, more than is given to any other nation since World War II. And that's $3.8 billion annually. Why is more of our money being given to Israel, the country with the 29th largest per capita GDP in the world, ahead of the United Kingdom, for example, more than the total amount of aid that we give to Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean combined. Zionists like to say we're singling Israel out, but we're also critical of other countries like Saudi Arabia, Colombia, Brazil, and do this up until their last election, and of course, the United States. Now it is, no, it's the Zionists that are singling Israel out as a country that's above international law. 
a nation which apparently believes that Palestinians have no rights that Israelis are bound to respect. I hope that by looking at Palestine Israel for this last segment, we can see how to use the UDHR to look at a single subject. I started off with the idea of using five or 10 of the 30 articles. I ended up needing to include 25. So for the last part, Article two, everyone has the right to regard, uh, has these rights regardless of religion, language, or national origin. But Israel's most recent basic law asserts, quote, the right to exercise national self-determination is unique to Jew the Jewish people, end of quote. Security. How can people feel secure with tanks rolling down their streets or settler violence in their neighborhoods? Palestinian children grow up with something like post-traumatic stress disorder, only it's not post, it's ongoing. Torture of Palestinians in Israeli prisons. Yes, solitary confinement and guard brutality is torture. The right Equality before the law, Palestinians, including children arrested in, by Israel are tried, if at all, in a military court system set up just for Arabs. The right to sue in court, it was only a year ago when Palestinians gained the right to sue Israeli settlers in the courts of the Palestinian Authority renouncing agreements made with the US and Israel that protected Israelis from accountability. The right to be not be arbitrarily arrested. According to Israeli human rights group, Bet Salem, Israel routinely arrests Palestinians with the allegation that the person plans to commit a future offense. The right to defend yourself from charges, according to also according to Bet Salem, quote, administrative detention is incarceration without trial or charge. Israel employs this measure extensively and routinely and has used it to hold thousands of Palestinians for lengthy periods of time, end of quote. The right to be considered innocent until proven guilty being Palestinian is enough to be considered guilty. The right to move around in their own country, leave it and return. Military checkpoints prevent the freedom of internal movement, while Israel won't even consider the right of return for refugees in spite of its pledge to the UN to do so. The right to asylum, Palestinians certainly need to have this right guaranteed to them. The right to a nationality, Israel officially denies Palestinian nationality while declaring Jewish one. Marriage rights, a law renewed year after year by the Knesset barring Palestinian Israelis from marrying non-Israeli Palestinians and living with their spouse in Israel was finally defeated this year. But a generation of Gazans are forced to forego marriage because of the economy forced upon them by Israel. The right to own property, routine destruction of Palestinian homes and Palestinian orchards violate these rights. The right to religious freedom, Israel closure policies prevent tens of thousands of Palestinians from accessing places of worship in Jerusalem and the West Bank, even during religious holidays. The right to express ideas, Palestinians are persecuted for such expression 
and people expressing their solidarity are intimidated by accusations of anti-Semitism. The right to join organizations. Last, this last October, Israel designated six more orgs, organizations illegal, including the Defense of Children International, Palestine. The right to, um, the, the right to elect governments, Israel have the free, Israelis have the freedom to choose anti-Palestine parties, but Gazans are being brutally punished for electing Hamas. And Palestinians in the Knesset can be expelled by their peers by a majority vote, simply for expressing their views. The right to receive aid as needed. Gaza suffers from border and coastal closures and internationalists are arrested or shot for trying to bring them aid. The right to decent jobs. Unemployment rate in Palestine increased to 27%, the highest in the world in the third quarter of 2021 according to the International Labor Organization. The right to leisure, for those who have jobs, their leisure time is greatly cut by long waits and checkpoints. The right to food, housing, and medical care, home demolitions, military checkpoints on the roads to clinics and hospitals, as well as occupation and forced poverty thwarts these rights. The right to education, including about human rights. Nurit Peled el Hanan, Israeli researcher, found the Israeli textbooks to be racist, but she found that Palestinian textbooks differentiate between Zionists and Jews. The right to artistic freedom, free muse, an international organization advocating for artistic freedom. Documented in 2021 alone, more than 13 cases of Palestinian artistic freedom violated across Israel and Palestine. The right to peace at home and throughout the world. Right. And Article 29, the responsibility to ensure other people's rights. U.S. citizens have that responsibility to defend Palestinians. Well, there you have my impression to human rights. Perhaps we can at least come to an understanding that when our government opposes popular revolutions, whether or not those governments do violate some human rights of some individuals. It is not for those reasons that our government opposes them. Rather, it's because they promote the human rights of their people at the expense of the US corporation. Maybe we can rise from our easy chairs and come to an understanding of how those hostilities affect the decision-making and give them some of our solidarity to their efforts to do good. Thank you, all of you, for being here and for participating. I look forward to hearing from you. It was a great presentation, it really Thank was. You. Yeah. And tremendous, yeah. Um, I put in the chat that I'd like the link to particularly one of those um, one of those maps, one with all the circles on it, because uh, I think it was really good. Thank you. Um, both of them are, I mean, one of them is healthcare or longevity and wealth, and the other one is both the UN Human Development Index and the low carbon footprint. Both of them are, because I can tell you this, the, the one that's the Panda one, uh, World Wildlife Fund one, you Google um, 
it, a World Wildlife Fund. Um, I, I'll have to look it up again. I'm well, blanking on. Put it in the link or, or whatever or whatever or email it to us. Oh, okay, but then you have to scroll down because it's a long report with lots of different graphs. But yeah. you'll come to that one. Okay. Carol Francis, can you see the chat? Um, I can. Oh, there's yeah. seven. Steve has raised a few questions, so I was just wondering. Okay. Okay, um, so great to see you after all these years. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, the universal, this from Michael, the universal declaration was uh, adopted in the shadow of the genocide before and during World War II, which probably explains the exception that Steve cites to free speech. That's very interesting. I really think we should have um, a future forum on that. Stephanie also has a hand up. Stephanie, did you want to say something or just? Oh, I didn't think I had a hand up, sorry. Uh, okay, please clarify the Cuban constitution prohibits the communist party from involvement. Or did you say interference? Either one, In, you can't involve, you can't take, you can't campaign, you can't, the party cannot campaign. This constant, there's only one political party that is national, and that is not based on anything Karl Marx said. It's based on what Jose Marti said in 1898, um, where he was before he was killed fighting for um, Cuba's independence. And he said, we need to be unified. We need to have one party. So the one party now is the Cuban constitution, is the Cuban Communist Party, but they can't get involved in elections. I know that's really sounds crazy because all we think of with parties is, you know, only the involvement in elections. Do candidates run as members of a political party? No. Look, there's this great book called Democracy in Cuba, and I've got to admit, I haven't read the whole book. It's 600 pages, and I just freak out when I see 600 pages. But I heard the guy speak. He's a Canadian, who, and he describes how in neighborhoods they get together and they vote on somebody who is, um, that they know from their work, from their organizing, their different segments, the women's group, the students group, the small farmers group, the neighborhood group, the, you know, whatever. And they, they vote, they nominate people that they know. And those people, when they voted in to the um, regional, to the local re um, parliament, they vote on people for the regional and the regional people vote on the national people. So everybody's really voting on people they know, but everybody has the same, I mean, it's paid for by the government. The, here are all the candidates for this office in this region. And here's the same number of words in the same size picture. There's no big money influencing people. That's why they have such a great turnout. And, they had the best turnout I've ever seen. It was over 95% when in response to the right wing calling for a boycott of the elections. And <laughs> totally blew it because they had just about everybody turned out to vote. Um, can you give us a link to the map with the dots? I'll do that. You know, and also I'll give you the link to the um, war on Cuba. I really want everybody to go watch. Um, I just lost my um, my chat and just went away. Um, today's topic, you can hear clips of the beautiful suite written by two great musicians. This is from, from Rick, me. the music. The so, music. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Jack DeJunette and John Sermon wrote this piece. Um, basically based on the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights is called Free and Equal. It features oh. um, 
orchestration that they wrote for the London Brass. And uh, there are clips here, and you can also find clips online. It's, it's, it's a beautiful piece. So uh, I just want to, to highlight that. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Now, Rick, you had a question that you wanted to raise um, earlier, and you said you'd wait till later about why you voted both ways on something. Uh, was that and that's, on, excuse uh, me, that's exactly what rethinking human rights is, is saying, oh, I'm not sure of this. I think it was regarding uh, regulating speech Mm -hmm. our, our country's regulating speech. I, I think that with questions like that, it's extremely complicated. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can't, um, you can't cover everything that um, is going to come up in a situation in any document. Um, you know, uh, I don't think even 30 years ago, anybody envisioned that uh, something as pervasive as uh, social media would be able to change the perception of people regarding vaccination mm -hmm. or the or the right or or or, or the right or um, uh, deny the people deny anybody a right to storm a federal building. Uh, you know, so um, I, I think that that as as society develops and as society changes, I'm I'm not saying that it's uh, it, it's uh, evolve. It's it it might be devolving, but as we change either way, it, we have to understand how human nature has to be part of whatever computation we make with uh, with. Uh, um, you know, free speech uh, issues, you know, uh, there's Senate, Senate meetings, or there was a Senate um, uh, meeting about uh, um, Instagram, and how it is actually when when kids are looking at things regarding um, binging, uh, and and purging, and bulimia, they're actually targeting kids with information that could be harmful mm -hmm. you know um yeah. and and, yeah. Yeah. and, and it, it, it's it's something to think about and um you know i think also too you have to wonder what kind of e economic system have we set up where that's profitable yes okay. yeah mm-hmm Um, Stephen, I'm um, Steve, sorry. Yes, so uh, gathering up uh, some previous questions, I agree with Rick that especially in the First Amendment area, these questions are extremely complex and they are so uh, based on the context in which the questions are asked or the situations arise. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I have a very robust uh, defense of the U.S. First Amendment, it's not absolute. Uh, there is no First Amendment right to attack the Capitol. And recently, there was a $26 million verdict against the white supremacists who organized and carried out the violent rallies in Charlottesville in 2017. Uh, and the court held, and I agree and have written on this, that the, the planning on social media of a violent um, rally and the carrying out of that rally and even the slogans and the social media posts that were evidence of that conspiracy, none of that is protected by the First Amendment. So uh, the last two questions at the beginning of your presentation which was excellent. I love the graphics and I love your comprehensive analysis of the Universal Declaration. I think it was something like, would you support the government uh, regulating um, expression uh, in some context? I, I answered no. 
and some others also answered no. But then you asked, could you ever imagine any restrictions on freedom of speech? And I answered yes to that because uh, I've just given a couple examples where uh, you can uh, prosecute, uh, penalize, sanction uh, certain forms of speech. Uh, when you went, when you lost the chat, uh, uh, Carol Francis, you skipped over my uh, second question. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, oh, no. give it of course. So it's in there and it asks, can we discuss Amnesty International's reports condemning human rights violations in Cuba. I grabbed one of them where they've named six prisoners of conscience uh, who were journalists and other opposition leaders engaging in uh, right of assembly and right of free speech. Uh, the link for everybody goes back to Amnesty's uh, series of reports. They are critical of the government of Cuba in repressing uh, free speech. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I knew you would. Amnesty International is a very interesting organization. I really support it. Uh, usually, I think its work is, uh, we would, the world would be in a terrible mess if uh, even more than it is now if Amnesty International wasn't doing its, its uh, work. However, um, there's this great report called Why Amnesty International is Wrong on Nicaragua. And it's another one I really think you should all read. Even though it's not specifically on Cuba, it says that Amnesty International kind of lumps together violence, um, state violence and violence against the state. And what I have seen personally, uh, I got this um, mailing back in the days when we got mailings instead of emails. And on the envelope, it says Amnesty International were working against all these countries that have violations of human rights. And the first one mentioned was Cuba. Well, I, you know, okay, it, I don't know. And there may be people who shouldn't be in prison. I, I haven't been able to, research all of the, the the facts on that. But why was Cuba's name first? There's no way it was, it was worse than others. The Amnesty International feels, I'm sure, and I understand this, that in order to get credibility with the United States and credibility with um, people who are pro-United States and anti the people that are, are the countries that the U.S. you know it's against. It needs to say, hey, look, we're criticizing Cuba. Everybody, see, we'll put that first. And it gives the impression that it's like, oh my God, everybody knows it's the worst. And like I said, I haven't been able to find the information I put out to very busy people, please send me any information about Amnesty International on Cuba. And I haven't gotten a response on that. But I feel that if there are some people in prison because of speaking out, which is, you know, I, I remember when, remember when there were, um, there were two big eruptions in Cuba, I, in the 90s maybe, one was a whole bunch of uh, people hijacking boats and forcing them at gunpoint to take them to the United States. And the other was people arrested, supposedly according to our government, for, um, for going to, for, for speaking out against the government. But it turned out that in that case, no, there is no law against people speaking out. Look at that uh, huge um, protest in July. Yeah, people were arrested for violence, but they weren't arrested for, for 
protesting, there is no law against protesting. There is a law against you taking United States government money to do your protesting work. And I think, thank you, Cuba, for having that, because we probably wouldn't have, we would probably have the same thing that um, we had in Nicaragua. And that is the fall of the revolution, because the US would fund some counter revolutionary who would, uh, you know, I, you know, but the law says you cannot take money from the US government to do your dissident work. And here were this videos because in all of those dissident organizations, there are people working on the Cuban, working for Cuba as volunteers, they're double agents. They're, you know, they, the, the joke is that if the CIA's people and the uh, Cuban security people left all the dissident groups, there wouldn't be anybody left. Um, but they had proof that these people were sitting with James Kaysen, the head of the Cuban, the US intersection in Cuba, and taking money from them to do their dissident work. And they were called political prisoners. I mean, no, they broke the law. And the law says you can't take money from a, from a government that is trying to destroy you. Um, Carol Francis, John's had his hand up quite a long time. Yeah, John, John. Oh, I, I was just gonna say uh, regarding uh, First Amendment issues, um, just a real point of ambivalence for me is that uh, you know, I like to think of myself as as much of a First Amendment absolutist as possible with, you know, exceptions for yelling fire in a crowded theater and things like that. At the same time, I reluctantly must admit how much more peaceful and quiet it's been since Trump was thrown off of Twitter. So I, I, I'm still trying to sort that one out. Okay, thank you. You know, I think uh, when, when we talk about that, there's a difference between an, a decision a company makes regarding its economic uh, or, or, or its business practices, um, as opposed to, uh, you know, shutting down somebody's right of free speech. Uh, you know, um, he, it, it, Twitter is a private company. And they can make decisions based on um, their business practices the way that they want. Um, they can have consequences from that where people don't use their product, uh, which would probably be a good thing. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, he still has, he can still leave his house. He can still go play golf. He can still, you know, um, do, do what he does. Um, but there's no absolutist right for him to, to um, go against the, the wishes of a private company. Um, Can I add something or, or am I starting to be a mic hog? Go ahead. The, um, I used to have a Twitter account with uh, 2000 followers and um, Twitter falsely claimed that I was threatening people. I, I wasn't. I, I, I used a little, I used a few bad words, but I wasn't threatening anybody. And they suspended my account and I had no, basically no right of appeal. So again, it's, it's, it's a private company, but it's one that to a large extent has kind of commandeered the public square. Uh, that, that, that's all I have to say about this. Yeah, I, I think to me doing this research on this, what struck me is that, you know, we talk about limits to the rights to the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, freedom of expression. We talk about that as, well, how far can you go in limiting that? And are there places? 
But if instead we talk about balancing that right with other rights that it's in conflict with, the right, the, the third article is the right to security. Now it's security, I looked it up in Merriam-Webster online, I love that site. And it has a definition of not only being threatened, but fear of being threatened. So if a black person hears a siren from the police and it instills fear, that is a violation of that person's right to security. Even if the police car goes by and doesn't stop them. So that right to live in peace and, and security, dignity, you know, that I believe is covered by the Third Amendment. Also, the uh, Fifth Amendment not to be tortured. There is psychological torture involved. And so instead of just saying, well, is the First Amendment sacrosanct? Can it ever be tweaked? To say, is this exercise of what's considered the First Amendment right in violation of the right to security, the right to not be tortured, the right to food and shelter and housing if the wealthy are allowed to spend their money or a foreign government that hates the revolution is allowed to spend our tax money brainwashing another people, overwhelming them with um, paid ads or paying funds to organizations like $6.6 .6 billion that Biden gave to these organizations to do these things. Can we balance that First Amendment right with the right to have what they need with the other rights, which are not spelled out in the Bill of Rights, but are spelled out in the Cuban and Venezuelan, Haitian and Nicaraguan constitutions. So Anthony. Not hearing you. You're muted. Anthony, we can't hear you. I'd love to be able to hear you, Anthony. I'm sure you have something to say. Rose has her hand up. Okay. Shall I come in while we're waiting for Anthony? Yeah, definitely. Okay, it's a quickie. It's just that reading the UN Bill of Rights and it just sounds so, I mean, I'm talking as a foreigner here, it sounds so American. I mean, you know, they're all rights, fine. But, um, you know, when I'm in Britain or in Europe, I mean, some of those rights are not considered the same. For example, uh, most of Europe has very strict rights, again, um, laws against race baiting, you know, kind of, there are things you cannot say racial things, prejudice things, things like that. And I'm with those laws, I really am. I mean, the First Amendment, in my humble opinion, <laughs> goes too far. I mean, you know, the things that some people are allowed to say in this country just send shivers down my spine. And I think if the human, UN Human Rights thing and committee got together today to rewrite it or write it again, now that some of the countries like China and India have kind of developed more kind of clout. Some of the things might be different, actually. Just a thought. Yeah, I, there is one of the articles that I read when I was preparing this and I was thinking I was going into the question about uh, ACLU demanding the First Amendment or uh, protecting the First Amendment rights to everybody was an article specifically on that. And that is that in European countries, they have exactly what you said. And I think 
I'm really glad we have a British person here speaking on that. Um, Steve asked in the chat, maybe Cuba was listed alphabetically. No, that was the first thing I checked and they weren't. Okay, Michael's got his hand up. Okay, Michael, good. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out to people, I put in the chat uh, a link to the uh, British court ruling uh, that uh, they will uh, extradite Julian Assange to the US to face Espionage Act uh, charges for you know releasing all the videos showing US war crimes in Iraq. So when we're talking about human rights violations, I think mm -hmm. you know the US is the biggest violator of human rights in the world and we should be aware of that. Um, he is going to appeal that decision to a, a high, yet a higher the Supreme Court in, in the UK. But, uh, you know, at this point, he's in, you know, danger of being brought here to stand trial. That's all. Yeah, I want to um, promote, uh, to give Anthony's thoughts. He put it in the chat. Please move on. I'll type my comments. Two concerns I have. First, I distrust the government having the power to say what's detrimental to the good of this country. Yeah. The U.S. uses arguments to go, this argument to go after whistleblowers like Julian Assange. Second, I'm concerned about police arresting journalists. It's been happening. I just jumped. Um, uh, this has been happening increasingly in the U.S., according to a recent L.A. Times article. Journalists need to be free to witness and report on demonstrations, and people have the right to say things that the government feels is detrimental to its interests. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Steve says, terrible decision for human rights and freedom of the press. And like I said, you know, when the, Reagan was getting so upset that the Sandinistas finally shut down this U.S. greatly funded by the U.S. La Prensa newspaper. In the meantime, in El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala, um, journalists weren't getting arrested. They were getting murdered. And of course, the government would say, oh, it's it's street crime and so that's why we have to brief up our police but the only ones getting worded uh murdered were the journalists and others working for uh against the government um john wrote to pick up on what anthony said in the u.s journalists are increasingly subject to police violence and the police blocking them from doing their jobs. Amy Goodman has pointed out that media people, the journalists, is the only profession protected in the US Constitution. And I, I remember her telling about being in East Timor during an attack by Indonesia on a march, and they went forward with their uh, press credential saying, US media, US media, and they move forward towards the, the, the soldiers, hoping that, you know, they wouldn't attack the journalists from countries that, um, that were paying, their, paying, you know, for them. Anyway, yes protecting journalists is protecting our right to know. I don't see any more chats. No, I think we're coming toward the end. I think oh, yeah. we're kind of early because we didn't have a reflection today. So I keep looking at the clock thinking we've still got a few more minutes, but I think you've done a great job, Carol Francis, and thank, thank you, you so much. And I maybe we will actually finish on time for once or even slightly early because we also did a lot of our reports, I think at the beginning. Um, if, any, if nobody else has anything to add, then we will um, move on. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you, Carol Francis. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, okay, <laughs> we kind of did this at the beginning as well. Um, any more reports from any other groups that we wish to, um, to advertise? Anything happening that we need to know about? Or do we just go on to our closing circle? Uh, can I just uh, say something briefly? Absolutely. The, um, let's see, um, I'm trying to get in touch with Fidel uh, to see if uh, he'll be available to play the drum at the Guantanamo Pro Center. I know Phil, uh, Phil Way met with him and I guess he was sort of non-committal. So uh, anyone who has um, uh, links to Fidel or, or, or anyone who knows how to play the drum, uh, please let me know. And since we have a moment on that, John, so far, could you uh, alert people to the time and location of the event in person? Uh, any speakers that you so far have been able to confirm? Sure, of course. Uh, the, um, you know, our, uh, our regrettably annual closed Guantanamo now uh, Protest rally will be held at the downtown Los Angeles uh, Federal Building, 300 North Los Angeles Street, zip code 90012. Uh, that'll be Tuesday, January 11th from uh, noon to 1.30 p.m. Uh, speakers uh, so far confirmed are uh, Mohammed uh, Tajsar of the ACLU. There's a slight asterisk there. I need to check back with him, but I'm hoping he'll make it. Uh, Este Chandler of Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, Carly Town of Code Pink, uh, Shaquille Syed of American Muslims for Palestine, uh, Jim Lafferty of the National Lawyers Guild, and uh, Shane Cuhey of Out Against War. Our uh, intrepid uh, tableau of detainees will consist of Carol Francis Likens, Grace Durness, Louis Chase, Michael Novick, Dave Clemens, uh, and uh, Anthony Manousis, uh, endorsing organizations so far are Addicted to War, Anti-Racist Action LA, Council on American Islamic Relations, Courage to Resist, uh, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, the National Lawyers Guild, and uh, Physicians for social uh, responsibility. And uh, I will put a, um, a link to our uh, uh, ICUJP's uh, Close Guantanamo page uh, in the chat. If everyone would like to forward that to their list, uh, I would be greatly obliged. We are uh, traditionally, we've, we've had a little trouble with attendance. So we're, uh, we're hoping to do better on that this year. Uh, that's that's as much as I have to say. And I just want to add, we are immensely grateful to John. He alerts us to this early in the fall. He organizes so many aspects of the event. Uh, he's really been a stalwart on this. It is tragic that now under the Biden administration, we are still protesting and demanding closing Guantanamo, which also includes the lack of accountability for the torture that has gone on there for uh, almost 20 years. So thank you, John. And, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Thank you for joining us to let us know those uh, details. Could, could we have the date again and the time? Yes, it's uh, Tuesday, January 11th, uh, from 12 noon to 1.30 PM. And it's at the downtown LA Federal Building at 300 North Los Angeles Street. The timing was an attempt to grab attention of lunch goers coming and going in the court area and the federal building area. And as John said, with our new communications director, uh, we are trying to see that it could be live streamed on Facebook and elsewhere. So you'll hear more about that later. Oh, speaking of our new communication director, I, I'm sorry, let me quickly mention, um, I, I did want to thank uh, Morgan Tucker, our new communications director, 
uh, Ed Fisher and Phil Way who, who have been helping out on this. So. Okay, if there's uh, nothing more, I think we'll go to our closing circle. Um, anybody, anybody wishes to mention? Carol Francis? Carol Francis, you're muted. Okay, I'm putting into the chat uh, the website for Warren Kuba, the um, really great series that I really want everybody to watch, and the two charts that um, I believe it was Rose asked about, or was it? But somebody asked about it. I'm putting that in, so I've got one more to do. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Vida? I would like to lift up um, prayers for my friend, Dr. Susan Mackinson. She's a wonderful woman, organist, musician, pediatrician, retired. And she took a fall last mm. week, two weeks ago, and is in rehab and a lot of pain. And it's just, it's very sad. So we'll have to lift her up in our prayers. Thank you, Steve. Uh, two things. I want to lift up my sister. She had a procedure a few days ago. She uh, lives near Washington, D.C. Her name is Elaine. Uh, she's a few years older than me, and uh, she's uh, recovering well. She expects to return mm -hmm. home today. Uh, it always is very um, worrisome when a relative goes uh into such a procedure and I'm just grateful she's uh, recovering. Secondly, uh, we've had a couple COVID scares close to our family and I just want to uh, lift up anyone who has either uh, uh, contracted the disease, is close to anyone who has, is in any settings. I think we still have to remain so vigilant, careful, uh, get your booster shots, continue to recognize and avoid uh, unplanned or unregulated indoor settings. Uh, let's take this very seriously through the fall um, and hopefully convince the family members over the holidays if they are vaccine resistors uh, that for their sake and the sake of their families and the rest of us, uh, they need to get fully vaccinated. Thank you. John? Yes, um, I, I'd like to hold up uh, Julian Assange, his family, and what's mm -hmm. uh, left of the First Amendment. Um, I think it's uh, sad that uh, uh, President Biden, in many ways a slavish acolyte of Barack Obama, uh, fails to heed him in acknowledging that we, the, the, the New York Times problem. Um, also, of course, I want to hold up the uh, detainees at Guantanamo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, want to, I wanted to lift up the, the, the people in prison because uh, as, as far as uh, my concern is that we have the uh, uh, 2.3 million, you know, people that are in jail, and another maybe a uh, three to five million in and out in a court system, you know. And I think uh, this is the interest of uh, monopoly capitalism, you know, the privatization of jails and so forth, you know. And it seems to me that uh, they're losing their constitutional right or human rights. You know, because this is a simply a, a massive uh, uh, criminalization, particularly the black and the brown. And so, and also, you know, the, the people here in the United States seems to me that we're really losing our constitutional right in terms of many of the human rights, as uh, some people mentioned, you know, Julian Assad, you know, this is really a sign that uh, 
that this uh, imperialist or money making people are really, you know, this is the, the class contradiction in all of us. So I want to lift them up, you know, to hopefully continue the fight that uh, we, are, we are doing. Thank you. Well, I want to do a lift up in a totally different direction. Every year for the last 25 years, uh, St. Michael, uh, St. Yeah, St. Michael's and All Angels Church in Cedis has done a party called Holiday Cheer. And it was every year they would invite people. I've been involved with it for, I don't know, the last five or six years. And they bring in basically families who are, the women are fleeing domestic violence. And they also have um, bring on the bus, get on the bus group, they come to it. And they invite these families through, give them an enormous meal, give presents to the children, um, Santa Claus, you know, the whole works. And it's been a big, big thing. A lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort goes into it. And people sponsor by, they get sent the name of a child, they give a toy and they give clothes for the child. It's not even cheap, believe me. Anyway, for the last two years, it's had to be virtual. And um, a few days ago, an email came out saying that they still had 50 children who had not been kind of spoken for, you know, with the toys. There's a list of all the children. Mm -hmm. And I got one while we were on the line saying all those 50 children are now covered. I will be spending mm -hmm. tomorrow morning helping wrap things up. And we've got an army of people taking things, delivering them to the shelters and everywhere. And it's, to me, it's one of the best parts of Christmas. So I just wanted to lift that up. Yeah. I want to say that Anthony has put in the chat, please hold in our prayers, our homeless neighbors, congregate uh, shelters are not safe during the pandemic and motel vouchers are limited. So many homeless people will have to live on the street during the winter. And I'd like to lift up um, the people of Cuba and the newly uh, redirected Honduras and El Salvador, Guatemala, all those places um, where people are trying to make more human rights available for or recognized by more people. Thank you. Now, I did send uh, private chats to a couple of people asking if they were able or willing to do the closing prayer. Well, Anthony was one, he can't speak. So obviously that was pretty useless. <laughs> Vida, you were the other one. Did, were you able to or not? Maybe you didn't get my private chat. No, I didn't. <laughs> oh dear. Um, can we have a volunteer to just put something together fairly quickly? And just speak it out. I don't think we've got any priests with us, have we at the moment? Well, I guess the onus is on me and I'm not good at this type of thing. So it's going to be very short. And I just want to thank us all for being here for our communion. Carol Francis particularly for reminding us of all the things that have been going on in the world and how unfortunately so many countries are falling short of expectations. And for the Guantanamo Bay thing that's coming up and just for our group. And thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And Thank I you hope people much. stay for the committee meeting. Thank I have you. to leave at 10. I'm just giving you a heads up. I have to leave at 10. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Have a safe week ahead. See you next week at our holiday party. Hey. About a five minute break and then the committee. Good job. Thank you guys. Okay, I'll Francis. Thank you. Carol Francis. It's a, yes. Um, I I can't stay this rest of the uh, for the rest of the meeting today. It's Lucy mm -hmm. Daly talking. Um, so I just wanted to say I'm sorry about that and all the best for the meeting. Okay, hope, thank you. Lisa. Hope to see you next week. All right. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Also, mainly. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you for...
the comments.